Like I just had to follow my, my notes. <laughs>
fly away, brother. That's what happened one day. Appreciate that song as well. What a blessing it is. Lord, sir, man. They always do a beautiful job. Amen. It's good to be in South Asheville Baptist this morning. Amen. It's great to see you here in the sanctuary. And, uh, you know, we just went through the uh, anniversary of 9 11. That's a sad day to remember. Amen. And so we ask you to pray for those that were affected directly and for those that were affected indirectly. Our nation had never faced anything such as that. I suppose Pearl Harbor would have been the closest thing to that. But uh, it is great. When it comes to that and the loss of life, it's a great tragedy. I was thinking uh, this week about back in my earlier days of ministry, and uh, I had it on my heart all week. The first message that I ever preached I announced my call on Sunday morning, and the preacher Don Hare said, "Won't you preach tonight?" You talk about prepar preparation time. I mean, it was on. I prayed in every room in the house. I thought about going in the attic, but then I thought, "Well, I won't go up there." But I can still remember, and I'm sure that those of you that were there that day can remember as well. I know Beth was a teenager in those days. Charlotte, she was young. Carol. You're saved, man. Amen. Still, I am young. If I were to say, do you, can you tell me what the first message would have been? You might have gotten it right. But the first message that I preached on was the grace of God. I'm so thankful for God's grace. Amen. I'm thankful for what it did for me in my life. And what I've seen it do for so many in their lives. But God's, God's grace is always sufficient Amen. for every need. God's grace is good in the good times. God's grace is good in the bad times. Amen. God's grace is there at the hour of the day, night, or day. So I think about it here. I want to talk about today God's grace in a special way. This is not the exact message. My memory may be pretty good, but it's not that good. The Bible tells us that God's grace is freely given. And I'm grateful for that, aren't you? Amen. God's seen our need before we even realized we had one. God knew who we were and what we were. He knew all there was to know about us. And God said, I've got grace for you. I've got grace to meet every need in your life. It'll be sufficient for all that you'll go through for the good times and the bad. And God's grace is still that way today, beloved. So we know that it empowers people for service. Someone that tries to work outside of the realm of God's grace. But the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. That grace is freely given. There's no price that can be put upon it. Because God's already paid the greatest price that could ever be paid. He allowed and permitted and sent his son to this world to live. And in his moments of death, he took your sins and my sins and the sins of the world upon him. And he said at that moment in time, it is finished. God could not even look upon his son during those hours. The moon hid his face. The sun hid his face. Darkness covered this earth. I can only imagine how that might be. We can think about it, I suppose, in many ways. 
It enables people to live a simple life. Now, what do I mean by that? I say that because of this. Whatever God has used you or myself, God enables us to be able to do that by His grace. When God calls you to do a work, then God enables you to do that work. If God gives you the ability to be able to work in, maybe in a trade or with your mind, your hands, whatever, and the ability that God has given you, then he has grace to supply you to do that job. And that's one of the things that I think is vitally important in this day, don't you? Are you with me today? The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ himself, he showed and exemplified grace. His life was a life of grace. Wherever he went, whatever he done. When he called his disciples, I believe it was by grace they followed. When he healed the blind, it's by grace. He took mercy upon them. When he enabled that man at the pool of Bethesda to get up and walk, that was by grace. Hey, he knew he was there the very first day. And for 38 years, he had gone there day and day and day. Thank God that he was there, but also thank the Lord for those that were willing to take him each day to the pool. You know, that's the way prayer works sometimes in our life. We pray for someone for a great number of years before we ever see the work done in their heart and their life. I remember that. Though I've mentioned this before, my stepdad, I prayed for over 20 years for him. And the day he got saved was a glorious day. Amen. There was a change in him like I'd never seen. He was a good man, a good moral man. He was probably more moral than most people today that you and I meet. But that won't save you. It took the grace of God to do what needed to be done. And I appreciate the Lord for that. Amen. And then the grace of God, sometimes we demonstrate that through a self-sacrifice. How much are we willing to give? The Lord gave his life. How much are we willing to give for the Lord? When we stop and think about that grace that may abound, where that grace is needed, grace may abound. That means that you and I have that grace within us and we have the privilege and opportunity to be able to share that with somebody and to tell them our testimony, to tell them what the Lord done for you and what he's done for me and to share that gospel that is in the word that lives in us and let them see what God's done within us. Now that doesn't make us perfect, but it does make us forgiven. Amen. 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 So we see this in the scriptures. We know that there are a lot of things that are involved in, in this because we look at it and we think, well, I know that worked for brother so-and-so, or I know it worked for sister so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I'm just uh, not sure whether it worked for me or not. Well, I want to make, make you sure if you'll listen to this message today. And I'd like to say this because... I truly did love this man and appreciated him a great, great deal. And that's Preacher Don Harry. He believed in me. And he showed that he believed by my announcing my call on Sunday morning and saying, I want you to preach tonight. And so I certainly appreciate him, his family. What a blessing they were to me. In Paul's life, in the first few chapters of the book of Romans, he had a real battle. And the battle that he had was, in some cases, with those that he was uh, in opposition to. And in other cases, it was the thoughts that was upon his mind, his personal needs. Not that they weren't met, they were met. But he was wondering why, no doubt, these things had happened to him. But in Romans chapter 5, therefore he said, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. 
I'm grateful for that statement, aren't you? I'm glad you and I are truly forgiven today. There's no condemnation, nothing that can be brought to us or laid to our charge that would hinder our forgiveness of our sins. Thank God for that today. Though the guarantee of grace is what I'd like to talk about for a little while this morning, if you'll listen very carefully, we'll try to go through it in such a way to where that even a child could understand this today. There are some struggles in the Christian life, and I've seen people have to struggle. I've seen them go through things that, uh, that I could only imagine and, and pray sincerely for them, that God would uh, break the yoke of bondage and set the captive free, that he'd open the bars that those that are bound and give them liberty. Amen. For well, the Bible says where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Amen. Amen. And I'm grateful for that today. Paul understood that through the tough times, he wrote about them in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. But I want to speak out of Romans chapter 8 today and use a couple of about three different verses. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Thank God for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless your word today. I praise your servant today as we stand here. Lord, how many times have we stood behind this sacred desk? This one and others just like it. But God, each time we ask that you get glory. We pray that you'd open our hearts and the hearts of the people. May you use us as an instrument. As, you, as a tool in the master's hand. Use our mind, our thoughts, our speech. God, I may pray today that you might be glorified. Bless those that are here and others that couldn't be here, for we ask you today in Christ's name. God's people say it. Amen. May I say to you today that victory and freedom came by grace. Amen. Amen. I had a funeral one time at the Veterans Cemetery, and one of the men who were there in the honor guard uh, had received five purple hearts. And uh, he came to me afterwards, and I had uh, spoken because the man that I'd led to the Lord, uh, I had the privilege to uh, get to know him as a friend, and uh, I, I suppose in some degree, to lead him uh, through the life that he's seen. Uh, he asked me the question one day, what makes you different? That was his question. And I said, the grace of God Amen. is what makes me different. Amen. And beloved, if you're different today, it's God's grace that does it. Yes. There's nothing we can do. Paul understood this, and so he tells us that uh, there is a difference now. There's no condemnation. Boy, aren't you glad of that? You don't have to lay down at night and worry and wonder and, walk, and just wall in the bed and your pillow and all that, wondering if you used to die during the night, what would happen and, and where you'd go and what would be the possibilities of, uh, of God overlooking our lives at that time and saying, come on in. I want to tell you, there's no sin going to enter the kingdom of God. That's right. Amen. Nothing is going to enter heaven that would defile it. Everything there is holy. Amen. God's holy. Amen. God's heaven's holy. Amen. God's angels are holy. Amen. God's people are holy. Yes. God's word is holy. Amen. Heaven will sing a new song. It's holy. Amen. Everything about heaven is holy. Yes. Everything is pure. It's pure gold. The gates and the walls and all that's there is pure. There's nothing there that's not pure. And those that will enter into the gate, Jesus said by me, if any man enter in, he shall find rest and peace. He shall go in and out and find comfort. May I say to you today, you live in the world today of somebody else's eternity. Think about it. People that have been gone for a hundred years, you're living in their eternity today. We're still here. We're still human. We're still living and breathing, but we're living in their eternity. They're with the Lord today. Amen. Amen. What a great blessing that is. 
to be with the Lord. So there, therefore, it called for an answer to a question and word, therefore, therefore. When you hear that word, it's coming with an expression behind it that has something to make a statement that is worthy of looking at and examining. Not just a complicated word, not just a great big word, and not just something that would so show somebody's education or somebody else's uh, uh, thoughts on it, but God said, I want you to see what my thoughts are. And so he wrote it in the book. Therefore, no matter what, therefore, no matter how, therefore, that doesn't change. Therefore, does never change. It's still the same. Would you agree? Amen. So we see the guarantee as we look back to Paul's struggle. He had some hard, difficult times. He was beaten and shipwrecked. He was, he was, he was treated terribly. And uh, I've never known of anyone that's been treated as he was treated. And yet he stayed faithful to the grace of God because something happened to him on the road to Damascus that he could never get over. And if you're saved today, you'll never even walk to get over it. Amen. 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 So we see here, Jesus promised a deliverance from the condemnation in John 3, 17, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You see, it comes down to a matter of choice. When the Holy Spirit speaks to a person and he tries to convince or to draw them to the Lord, if they refuse him and reject him and turn him away, because of the flesh and the desires of the flesh, then he is guilty and is condemned. But there's still grace for him in an hour of need if he's willing to submit and say, God, forgive me, for I have sinned against heaven. You say, how do you know? Well, look at the thief on the cross. He was guilty when they put him on the cross. But the Lord said, this day thou shalt be with me where? in paradise he wasn't going to be in limbo he wasn't going to have to go through some kind of uh, cataclysm or something of that nature Jesus simply spoke the words and said this day thou shalt be with me in paradise the fool said in his heart if thou be the Christ take thyself down and, and in other words he's wanting to say and help me too but all I want to do is get down from here that's the way it is with a lot of folks today. They want just enough religion to try to coop, to, to appease their mind. Are you with me? Amen. That's why all these new religious orders is working and people are abounding to them. The Bible hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. His Holy Spirit hasn't changed. His songs hasn't changed. There's nothing about him that's changed. What could you do to make God any better? I don't know of a thing. Maybe you say you're old-fashioned. I may be, but I'm going to leave here that way too. Amen. When God calls me home, I'll be old-fashioned. I'll go the way of the grave. I don't need another book. I don't need another Bible. I don't need somebody to tell me what their thoughts and their opinion. I need somebody to preach to me the gospel of Jesus Christ, the infallible and inerrant word of God that stood the test of time, that's waited upon human beings over these hundreds of years to make a choice and accept Christ or to refuse him and to die and go to hell. Man makes that choice. God didn't make it. But may I remind you that God created even the devil. He was a created being. And yet he grew through pride and was cast out of heaven. He knows he doesn't have charge of anyone. But he tries to dilute them by giving them ideas or opinions or desires or wishes. There is no temptation coming upon you such as calm the man. James said that. But with that same temptation, God will make a way of escape. God will do that if a person wants him to do that. Amen. God, I need your help. 
I'm in a mess. I'm in a situation. I'm in a circumstance that I have no control. God, what are we going to do? How am I going to do? Where am I going to go? How am I going to do this, Lord, that you may be honored through it all? God sent his son into the world that people wouldn't have to be condemned. Aren't you grateful for that today? It was said by one of the great scholars I've written this down. He said, in the case of those who are in Christ Jesus, the divided state ends in the glorious triumph of the Spirit over the flesh. Flesh can't glorify God. Only the Spirit can glorify God. Well, how do you do that, preacher? I'll tell you how you do it. You let the spirit that's on the inside of you overtake the flesh. You don't let the flesh control the things of God. If he's in us, we are in him. And the Bible said that if we're in him, he'll be with us and help us and lead us and guide us and direct us. Thank God today he'll never leave us. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. So we see this as we look at grace guarantees that there is no legalism. It removes man's authority, man's ability to be able to save himself, to reach down by his bootstrings and pick himself up, all of that stuff that people have preached and I've heard it. And I think to myself, yeah, you probably picked yourself up with your bootstrings, fell and hit your head in the process. Because God's grace is what does it for all humanity. Yes, Nobody can do it without God's grace. I couldn't be here today. I couldn't speak without God's grace. It takes God and it takes the Holy Spirit inside of me. Because if you knew me back yonder, you'd say, how in the world did you ever get there? I think about Preacher Huntley, who was uh, the vice principal, then the principal, and uh, I knew him and his son's a, a good friend of mine to this day. And uh, he, he, he wanted me to come see him. And he had cancer and he was distorted due to the surgery. And he, I mean, his face and all. And he, it was pitiful. And he said to me as I sat beside his bed, he said, Norris, out of all the students that I was ever had privilege to be a part of their life, I would have never thought you would have been a minister. Why? I was mean as a devil. That's why. I'm not proud of it, but I was. I just lived that life that way. And he spoke to me and said, I want you to know how extremely proud of you that I am. I conducted his service, Miss Huntley's service, and still see Jerry on several occasions. <clears throat> A very dear brother. Our salvation is based strictly on faith, not works. Not anything we could do, it's based on faith. And the only way you get faith is by grace. You can't just reach up one day and say, yeah, 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 I want to take that. You don't get the privilege to pick and choose. It comes by grace. God doesn't have a smorgasbord where you go by and pick out just what you want and leave the rest. You pick whatever God puts on your plate. And you have to ask for that. Would you agree? Amen. Huh? If you want to look and examine that scripture, look at the publican and the Pharisee and the difference in these two men. I thank God I'm not as this man and I'm not this and this and this. He tried to justify himself by someone else. We don't justify ourselves by someone else. We justify ourselves by this glorious book. Amen. Only by the book. Amen. Amen. Well, I saw today 
God's grace, it guarantees no separation. In the 8th chapter, verses 38 and 39, for I am persuaded. That's a strong word, isn't it? You have to convince somebody to persuade them. Am I right? You don't just think something. Somebody has persuaded you to believe and convince them to believe because they believe it's true. The Bible's true. God's Word's real. Yes. When He said all the sin comes short, that's what He meant. When He said you can be forgiven, that's what He meant. When He said if you believe in me, you'll have everlasting eternal life. There's a lot of religions still wrestle with that today. They get saved every Sunday. There's some that think they've got to go to the baptistry to get their sins washed away. There's some that think they got to go through uh, cataclysm and remember all these scriptures and get them in your heart and, and memorize them in order to be saved. That's not true gospel. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ that he lived that he died on the cross of Calvary, was buried, and got up on the third and the forty morning, and, and ascended to the Father. Sits at the right hand of the Father today. Amen. Amen. If you remember back when we taught in the book of Galatians, how that they tried to mix the law with grace. They wanted to bring the law and circumcision and all these things that that they were going through in Judaism and try to bring that over into Christianity. And it's not right. It's never been right. It's Jesus Christ plus nothing minus nothing. Amen. Paul asked the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What can separate someone today? What can separate someone today? from loving the Lord Jesus Christ with all their soul, with all their might, everything there is about them, and showing that in the life they live, and living it before a lost and dying world, and saying, I'm saved by the grace of God, I'm kept by the grace of God, I'll be delivered by the grace of God, and I'll go to heaven by the grace of God. Amen. Well, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor any, or nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor high, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from God. Amen. And if it were possible, you couldn't separate God from you. Because of why? Because of the Holy Spirit that's on the inside, he's going to lead you back. You can go to the hog pen. God will lead you back. You can go to a far country. God will lead you back. Wherever you go, God's going to be there. Amen. I think about Brother Hanley Milby. He, he was, uh, uh, and still is living, but he, uh, he made this statement when God was dealing with him, he went and joined the army. And he went through boot camp, and he, and he was sent to Germany. And he thought to himself, well, I, I'm here now, and I won't be bothered with that anymore. And he said he hadn't been on the dock but just a minute or two, and the Lord said, I'm glad you're here, Hadn. I've been away from you. I think about him telling that and knowing that he was telling the truth. But listen, I'm saying this today. There's nothing that can condemn you if you're saved. There's nothing that can separate you if you're saved. Amen. You've got God's love and the Holy Spirit living in you, and there's no greater than that of love, for that is the greatest of all of the gifts. Galatians chapter 5, and we find in the Scriptures in verse 20, 21, 22, that those are the greatest, but the greatest of these is charity. Talk about love. Amen. Amen. So we see this. Nothing can separate us from the Savior's love. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You say, why didn't he put that verse at the end instead of at the beginning? God wanted you to think about 
what he's fixing to say. That's the way God works. Sometimes his mind is far greater than ours. He didn't make that the 38th verse. He made it the 37th verse. He didn't make it the 39th verse. He made it the 37th verse because he wanted you to think about what he's fixing to say right after that. God works that way. When you read and study the Bible, you'll find that to be true. Let me hurry right along. Listen, nothing can separate you. He'll be with us through the time. And when it, and, and while we're here, we're dealing in time. Would you agree? We're dealing in time. We make appointments. We make time. We make dates. We use months and calendar years. And all these things that was, was given to us down to history. When time changed from the Roman calendar over and and was given by the king the responsibility to a monk and then he changed the time and the dates because everything changed with it. And if you'll read and study the word of God thoroughly, you'll find that Jesus was born in B.C.E. 3. How that, Richard? Before he was born in the world, he was born three years earlier. Can I take a minute and explain that? I don't want to leave you here like a bumblebee in a jar. When they changed the calendar and the events of that calendar changed by date, then when Jesus was born by the calendar, he was actually born three years prior to his actual birth. Are you with me? So, people try to set dates, try to set times, and all these things according to the calendar. They don't know, okay? And they're just guessing, that's all it is. Because according to the, and if you study your Bible, and look back in the back, into the help section in your Bible, you'll find that that's what it is. I'm not a scholar by any means, and I'm not trying to impress someone with what little I know. But I'm simply saying, if you went to Israel and the guide begins to take you around, he'll, he'll mention BCE, before eternity. When Jesus came, he started the clock for eternal life. You ever thought about that? He started the clock for eternal life. Until that time, the Lord was taking people that were in and they were in a place that was called Haiti. And they were there until the Lord went and got the keys of death held in the grave. And he brought them with him. Are you with me? And so that's the way that worked. But anyhow, don't let me get into that. Not right now. There's more to it than that. And so it asks us this question. You know, if we take the responsibility and we respond to God, as he invites us to salvation, then we realize then, just that quick, just that quick, that God's grace done something in our heart that had never, ever happened before. Amen. You remember when you got saved? Yes, you remember how it was when you got saved? <clears throat> I mean, if something went through you, if you had got hit by lightning, you'd have got up and shouted. Because God's grace moved in and the old devil had to move out. Are you with me? That's why he torments us in our mind. He can't live in us. He torments us in our mind. That's the way it works. And, and the next thing is, beloved, and I'm encouraging those that are listening by the media, if you've never accepted Christ, today's the day to do that. And if you have accepted him, and you're going through problems and situations and circumstances, that are simply beyond your control. God has grace to meet that need. Amen. And so you have the guarantee of God's grace. I mean, it's there. It's a guarantee that God's grace will be sufficient. Amen. And then we have to ask ourselves this question. If I believe in it, and I know that it's real, and I know that God's grace is living in me, am I willing? To share that with someone else. Am I willing to share that with somebody else?
Now I'm going to say this, and I'm going to close. The hardest person in the world to witness to is one of your loved ones. Amen. That's the hardest person in the entire world to witness to right. is a part of your family. That's right. So the best thing to do in that case is, is simple and tell them what you believe and leave it at that. And then pray, God send somebody that can talk to them, that can have an influence over them, and they will listen attentively to what they have to say. The hardest person I ever tried to witness to was a family member. I've had them come down to this door and they called for me then. They wanted to hear me. They wanted to listen to what I had to say. But before that, I made a real talk to that woman. And you'll have that same feeling. But the Bible says we'll reap what we sow if we sow in faith. Okay? So when you sow that seed, believe it's going to come up. Believe it's going to come up. And it will. It may take it a while. But when God germinates that seed by the Holy Ghost of God, it's going to begin to grow. And it'll do what God sent it to do. We have the guarantee, church, of grace. We're going to make it through this epidemic. We're going to come through on the other side even better than we were when we started in it. Hope and pray some people will get their eyes open, their hearts right with God, and God will send them into the house of God here or somewhere to where they can worship God and enjoy the goodness of God in this life. Father, I pray you bless the message today. What a message it is, God, that you loved us enough to give us grace to be able to believe by faith and to accept Christ as our Savior. Thank you, Lord, that you forgave us of all of our sins. You washed us and made us whole. Then you set up your abode within us. And Lord, thereby you've given to us the privilege and opportunity that we could have eternal and everlasting life. God, I thank you for that great promise. Thank you for all you've done, for what you're doing, and what you're going to do. And God simply say today that by, I know by the grace of God, Father, we'll make it through this epidemic. And God, I pray that some eyes will be opened, ears will be opened, hearts will be changed. Families, God, can unite themselves together in the church. The Lord accepts you as Savior. Not because of me, but because of Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.